Hello and welcome back to 15. It's the start of season three. I'm Luke and joining me as always is Dan Wade. So you get the surname treatment. Not even I get that. How are you? No. Luke Oddy. You can find us both on Twitter. <laughs> Probably best to find me through George Alagaya, through all the uh, new members. Uh, Luke can be found by just finding his name, I guess. Um, I'm kind of rocking the, what, what would you describe my look today, Luke? As Scandi Techno. Scandi Techno. And yours? Mm, underdressed. Very good. Jaded. What are you doing in a, a room that's new? Is this to do with your new house? Or are you... A... Uh, no, I'm away with work, yeah. So I'm stuck in a hotel. And that is apologies for the iffy Wi-Fi. Okay. So I'm going off... You a... fancy doing what those um, kind of uh, reporters do, like when Serial, it was Serial, the podcast? She was in a hotel room and she got inside the wardrobe and put pillows around it while her room was soundproofed. I mean, it would have been an interesting treat for the YouTube watchers. Uh, just to the two guys that do that, nice to see you again, lads. Uh, thanks for watching us on YouTube. <laughs> for those that want to do that, link's in the bio. Uh, a little bit more about the podcast itself then in case uh, we're starting a new season and any new listeners, I'm sure they're going to be dripping in um we are a film review podcast we review the first 50 minutes of, of free films uh the idea is once you start a film on a streaming site you just turn it off it straight away because there's just so much choice we do the hard work for you we watch the f first 50 minutes of free films and then we tell you which one you should be watching just in time for the weekend dan we do let's get on with it yes Let's get on with it because we actually had somebody uh, reviewers of late, and what did they say, Luke? High no. brow, yeah. High brow criticism. Did you hear that, here, folks? Somebody said that. Finally, finally, us. finally turned Martha around. I think. Okay, so we're doing a Disney Plus special then, uh, because Pixar have released Turning Red, Nightmare Alley yep. has gone into Disney yep. Plus, and then we needed one more, so we picked the Kingsman. Okay, so Dan, let's start with Pixar because we're Pixar fans. Anytime a film Big comes Pixar out from fans. that studio, <laughs> thank you. Anytime it comes out from that studio, uh, even though that hit rate at the moment is literally about one in three, one in four, we're still going to give it a watch, get our eyeballs on it. And let's start with that then. What did you think? Turning. So this is Pixar's first foray into kind of um, East Asian. Um, yeah, I said the word Oriental the other day, and someone told me off. You know, you know, you know, I'd say Oriental. No, no you should never. <laughs> just, just can you, Far can East. You beep yourself. Well, it's just, yeah, East Asian. Or, well, let's start there Asian. then, because whilst we're already in that sticky topic, let's yeah. focus on um, the aesthetic of Far East. So right. we've talked about this before in our criticism, not really criticism, but just discussion. This sort of friction between our Pixar doing this because they're sort of the cynic would say they're mining these sort of cultural uh, cornerstones for like commercial yeah. gain, or are they showcasing such cultures to sort of bring the eyes to like sort of break down xenophobic walls and barriers and stuff. But that's oh. an interesting discussion. That's probably the safest way I can phrase it without sounding racist. Yeah. I think based on what we're seeing on screen, it's possibly the former. Mm -hmm. because this isn't particularly Far Eastern. This doesn't isn't particularly evocative of any culture. And the culture that it is feels very set in an um, American kind of commercial capitalist way. You know, the K-pop is that they're all these girls found art about is very much, you know, it's not really K-pop, is it? It's, it's American no. K-pop. It yeah. feels a bit well, she's she's very american i assume at some point this film is it's sort of like it's a kafka-esque story isn't it, about metamorphosis and so on so i assume it's going yeah. to be an identity and this identity might also have something to do with her dual allegiances between china and america so maybe that will come I up then so. give it benefit of the doubt um let's go back to a bit more of the basis of the film then so it's set in 1999 and it seems like a sort of semi-autobiographical film tied to the director who's the director of this one sorry domi she um so I don't know anything about her. Do you know? Um, I do. I know her back uh, catalogue. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Big fan. Big <laughs> no fan need, of her no work. need to say it here. We haven't got the time, but uh, no, he we does haven't. Know it, folks. Um, it does start appallingly the first few minutes. Um, oh, dreadful. Luckily, we're not called five because we probably would have not recommended this film if it had just been that long. 
Um, it's like a non-ironic walking start, like breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. And it's appalling. If you think Deadpool, very self-aware, but not in a good way. It really kind of, oh, arm's length away. Um, and, and we're like, we're immature and we can put up with a lot of stuff, but this was far too immature for me. The opening titles. Yeah. Um, what did you think of the pacing then, especially? Well, it was fast. It was quick, which is good. We always like quick. Um, I mean, you don't have to watch them for long. Um, not at all. No, but <laughs> it that was voice. Always... It's made it yep. to season three. Yep, always. Um, but it was too fast, didn't you think? It was, yeah, it was. breakneck speed. Even, <laughs> even I, great phrase. Even I wouldn't, um, I'd probably turn this back off 1.25. I'd be yeah. worried I'd put it on 1.5, actually. It was that quick. Um, yeah. So the, put it on one on zero point seven five. So the the kid element. Have you listened to this podcast on zero point five? By the way, anyone that's doing it now, go and listen to this podcast on zero point five. We sound drunk, and not just the episode where Dan was literally drunk. <laughs> drunk. Um, the previous one. <laughs> um, yes, just the previous. So the yeah the kid element was bad, but then when it sort of developed into these exploring these teen subjects more, that's when it sort of grew, didn't it, and started to blossom. That was much more interesting. Well, you said this to me and thought it was going to be another film and i found this with in the last 10 years you know since car i think pixar have really kind of uh, devalued themselves debased themselves some some sort of word like that in that they because they've tied in with disney so much that they're just mass produced there seemed to, used to be a luster around pixar and there's not that anymore but you pointed it out to me that this is about menstruation and um kind of burgeoning sexuality and discovering yourself and that kind of shocked me because that's quite a grown up and if that is the case fair play to pixar mm -hmm. but that's sort of what i think you were driving at there with your first comment about where is this set and how is it being set because are is pixar genuinely trying to do something different here and talk about it in a very honest way or is it just paying lip service to it all I'm, no, I'm not sure based on what I've seen on the first 15 minutes. I I kind of am, you know, I'm kind of in their favour. I, I definitely agree with your analogy that like they're sort of, they're an indie band that's sold out. That does feel to be the case, but they do have these real gems every now and again, like Inside Out, Soul, two films about existentialism and about inner feelings, mm. incredibly deep films. I mean, this might not be like that, but it's about a, starting a discussion, I guess. I mean, they're using this stereotypical overbearing Chinese family maybe as a tool for that because... A big part of these first 50 minutes is uh, the Mimi, Mimi, the main character, sort of realising her sexual urges and desires and then being repressed. Yeah. And that causes the, the metamorphosis. And, and actually, I hadn't thought about this till you just said that, but she does seem the most immature of the th four, the group of friends that were introduced. Everybody right. else does seem a bit more... Developed. You know, mm -hmm. Yeah, and has that edge, and she's still very much got her little bindi bag, and she plays her flute, and she's top of the class, this sort of preppy, prim little girl. So maybe this, maybe that's very deliberate, and maybe the opening actually is very deliberate in that respect. So maybe this film is actually good. <laughs> I think I think it might be quite good. Um, I think yeah, I think like I said, I think the the desire here is to make parents and children like first of all listen to your children there's quite a big moment in the open 15 minutes where if the parent just stopped and listened she would have helped the entire thing out and the story probably yeah. would have been told it wouldn't have caused the change but also talk about these awkward topics i mean it's very easy for us to say that we don't have children that we know of yeah. so we don't what? have to uh what and you don't bleed from your penis uh, oh christ almighty um, neither do i <laughs> anymore <laughs> <laughs> Um, Just my I, anus. I enjoyed the sort of <laughs> thematic uh, assassination of this boy band culture. That was quite yeah. funny. They really did yeah. take a big swipe about at them saying these are real men and it's like these preemed uh, metrosexual guys. Um, what other elements of this film did you enjoy then? I liked the animation around the food cooking. That was beautiful. Dan Very loves important. Dan loves a bit of food porn. Everybody, Ratatouille food is his favorite porn. Pixar film. Absolutely, but this was almost better. This was almost, I think Marco Pierre White would have been <laughs> it was, popping it, at the chops. Uh, yeah, a lot of flourishes on those little but uh, scenes. You've said this before, and is there an element of the Lord of Diminishing Returns that you can't keep praising Pixar for and Disney for being good animators? 
they literally have all the money in the world. They should be pushing the boundaries on this. That said, I think it, it does feel different. This sort of feels like, to go back to that indie band analogy, basically, where you have a, a sort of bridge album that takes them from one genre to another genre. And it does, there is elements in it. It is faster paced. They're all, they're, they're breaking up scenes. They're doing, they're doing this very much. What you see is what is uh, sort of bled between what the character is really seeing and then what their emotions are laid over it. And that was quite nice. That, this is it was relatively inventive. Ben Man, everyone's been copying picks off for years. Do you know what I mean? Everyone's yeah, yeah. been copying them. So it's quite hard to keep innovating. Um, what else did you like then? Or, or disliking that fact? Oh, actually, you made quite a nice point about um, Metamorphosis appearing more and more in animation kids' films. Yeah, I think Pixar, when it began, had this, and I suppose it's all a slight transformation of sorts, but it was always that outside-the-box concept, Toy Story. So every toys and that, and when they're playing with them, they give them life. But everybody, every child has had that thought of what happens if your toys do come alive. So mm -hmm. it's playing with that. Ratatouille, what's the worst um, animal you could imagine in a kitchen? A rat. Let's make him a brilliant chef. Wally, a robot. Let's make him the most human character possible. You know, all these, let's give the old man who's dying the best adventure of his life and actually let him realise that life was the adventure, not this kind of weariness and desire to go on adventure in the first place. So it was always those moments of sort of thinking at the problem from the outside in. Mm -hmm. Whereas there became a point where, like, brave. So literally, it's Cars 2, I was looking. 2011, you came, you had the end of Toy Story, you know, which everybody said was that fitting final end to the kind of perfect trilogy. And you had Brave, where there's transformation into a bear. And mm -hmm. then, you know, we've seen that since in... Luca. There seems to be... Coco. Exactly. Yeah. Everything is turned... It's a physical transformation and what that represents. But I don't necessarily if that's clever because that's no. just repeating the same. It's not as subtle either. It with a different. Feel... No, it's not. Yeah, it doesn't feel nuanced. Yeah, it, it doesn't I... feel nuanced at all in that respect. It, it feels sort of not slightly below Pixar, but it feels a little easy. Yeah, I think you're right. And then, you know, Inside Out was great because that was actually a really. That was that was again let's talk about we've all had that thought as well of what's going on in my brain is is it and that kind of they gave life to that but then we went into the run of sequels and again it just seems like laziness it's it's and it's and i hate to say it but it seems like disney is kind of turning it into the cash cow because of the that golden age of pixar from you know 90, 95 when toy story came out to 2010 those 15 years and then just cashing in on that so, yeah, I, I just worry about um, about Pixar, whether or not it's selling out, or is it? Have we already missed the boat? But this film, having said that, and being you know a degree of metamorphosis, maybe this could be the 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 right story telling with that model, where yeah. perhaps it previously hasn't been. Yeah, definitely. We'll get onto the. We'll talk menstruation in a second, Dan. Don't you worry. But just to Good. follow on a little caveat to what you're saying, I I completely agree in terms of. Now we've got Disney Plus and you don't have to put some, as much money into the physical advertisement. It does feel as though they're going to be churning out more films a year, which could just dilute the, the talent you, pool, basically. Luke, do you think we could get The Good Dinosaur too? <laughs> Here's hoping. Uh, but to, quickly to talk about this film then, it does deal with, sim with uh, similar uh, forms as previous Pixar films, but it's talking about very interesting topics, talking about 13 right year old girls ish yeah. sort of preteen uh going through developing changes and maturity and sexual urges and that is that is brave that is clever yeah. i don't know how much they're it's gonna touch brave, it. it's turning red yeah they're using a red panda red they're using the red motif there yeah. again and again so i don't think i don't think they're gonna be too and they're kind of like it. beavers big hairy beavers yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh god right uh anyway all that said i'm actually quite intrigued i'd quite like to watch this it wasn't funny enough though that has to be said it wasn't very funny there was one character that was quite funny the little stout angry girl but god, the that's the it... politest he's ever described that character let me tell you <laughs> out and angry short and fat <laughs> uh you interested in watching that then yeah i think so i think they asked the right question that it's pixar isn't it so but stuff. we will wait and see at the end of the podcast. <laughs>
Do you reckon anyone is like on tender hooks finding out which one we'll pick? It's usually no. always the first one. I think if you, if you ran back the data, it's never the third film. We don't ever pick the third film. <laughs> so in full choice A, B, or C, you always go A. You never go down the middle with us. Yeah. Um, you... Next film is Nightmare Alley. Oh, yeah. interesting. So oh. this got a little bit of Oscar buzz, but then sort of yeah. fell flat. You know what I mean? It's gone under the radar, which is quite surprising because it's it's got that weird sort of saccharine Luke. tone all over it, and it's Guerrero de Toro. Go on. Luke, 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 Luke. You're forgetting once again the most acclaimed awards that there are. It got best costume design nomination at the BAFTAs. Dan constantly he beats the drum. More. For the BAFTAs, whereas I, I re- ever since Barker Abdi won Best Supporting Actor, it has just gone <laughs> yeah. from my radar. Yeah, not a fan Barker of it at all. Abdi. So <laughs> I am the captain. Look at me. Is I that don't appropriate? Know if I can say that. I don't know if I can say that anymore. <laughs> anymore? When could you? <laughs> <laughs> Twenty years ago. Um. Okay. So this film, a bit odd. So it got nominated for Best Picture. And it has a little bit of clout to it in terms of the cast Barbara Cooper's in it, Goy del Toro, as I said, writer, director. But uh, thingy, Kate Blanchett. Kate Blanchett, yeah, of course. But it feels like it's leaning a lot on this aesthetic of a creepy, dark circus, which, fair enough, Goy del Toro is. This is something that's quite interesting about him is he feels like he should not be mainstream. For me, his films are very acquired, his style yeah. is acquired, and he uses these strange aesthetics all the time and it's not for everyone. And I feel like people are talking themselves into the, him a little bit more, which means when he keeps putting out more and more films, they get pushed to the the front. And then if they don't do well, it's it's, it's classed as like a blow up, like a really bad film. Like it's absolutely just smashed, not smashed, the other way. It, oh yeah. I, I want to draw on something else you said there though, about this aesthetic, because I felt it that it just seemed and maybe this is me being very cynical but with it being on disney plus that this was just waiting in the wings to be a disney attraction the nightmare oh, alley really? circus vibes oh. it all felt it didn't it felt and i know that maybe that's his style maybe you can educate me here but it. it all just felt a bit set and i use that in inverted commas like and we're walking onto the set of the burning house and now we're going to the set of and it was almost like a disney theme park and the spooky nightmare alley sort of, sort of ride at, at at disney yeah no i i struggled with this first 15 minutes particularly in terms of i just sat there and i was watching okay what are the themes and what is the point here and i know it's yeah. quite easy film criticism but it's it's really nice to be able to pin a film's thematic theme like where is it going what's it trying to say what can we base this on? What's interesting stuff is it talking about? And there was none of that at all. It was just Wilm Dafoe chewing the scenery. My insane. Rad, 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 rad. <laughs> and Guerrero de Toro, right, for me, he's made one of my favorite films. He made Pan's Labyrinth, right? Which is another film yeah. that really leans onto aesthetic. Like he wants to do this weird, dark fantasy, but he uses it and he collages it with Nazi Germany, and uh, in, uh, in Spain, but as in Nazi yeah. occupied areas. Mm-hmm. And that's genius. Like it, it works, it's perfect, it's beautiful writing, and it fits its theme. It, it's sort of told like a kid's, a scary kid's tale. This yeah. just felt muddled to me, and I didn't really understand. I guess it, maybe it's going to be like retribution, because we originally see Bradley Cooper. And I'm, I'm a Bradley Cooper fan. I like him, he's a good actor. It's not his fault, he's very handsome. Do you know what I mean? Like, he tries to, he really does try to do serious roles, and he doesn't just like, like find the fact that he's like... You notice he's got a bit of a boss eye, though. <laughs> Has he? Yeah. Imagine, imagine you saying something like that about me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess it's about retribution because his character is shown burning a corpse, or, so, or even the burning part in the in the in the house at the start. That just felt a bit. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Bit uh, staged. Yeah, mm. it, it all well, felt the, a bit staged, the, right on the, stage, over the top. Yeah, yeah. The, the flames went in the very deliberate. It was all a bit. Yeah. Mm. Not sure. I'm not sure about this, I'm afraid. Again, very fast as well. Yeah, incredible. I mean, Absolutely. it has to be fast. At two Literally minutes, split. Two, two hours, 24 minutes, it better be fast. Do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, Stan said split is split. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, we met. We noticed a little bit of reticence in Bradley Cooper's acting. He was going for this Marlon Brando, 
like yeah. Ryan Gosling esque. I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, monosyllabic performance. It felt yeah. a bit strange because it wasn't. It wasn't drawing me in. I needed him to to draw me in like with yeah. his character. And he kind of was relying on the fact that we were going to be hooked on. Where's relying on what is he? Ron Perlman. <laughs> yeah, good old Ron Perlman uh, is in this film, which is uh, I feel like he gets so much work because of the way his face is structured. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's an incredibly liberal, you know, left-leaning American, but right. he just doesn't look like it, does he? His, head, his head's got a gravi- gravitational pull. Like, it is absolutely yeah. enormous. Um, he, um, yeah. Have we got anything he but jokes guns. to say about this film? He's <laughs> 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 it's, it's potentially libelous, libelous Stan. Um, um, I'm, it was I'm odd. I just put a bit odd, and I don't mean that in a in, uh, sort of sort of skewed, uh, you know, Gamma del Toro way. Because I think it just simply didn't sit right. I think that's what I mean by odd. Mm-hmm. In that, it, yeah, like you said, muddled and it's not quite got into itself or knows quite what it's going to be. Maybe it changes. You know, we see more of this nightmare alley because I don't think for something so fast, it didn't really get. Um, even even the name uh, Nightmare that... Alley, like Nightmare Alley, Sorry. it feels triad. It doesn't feel organic. It just feels. You don't need to call something. It looks like it alley. should be one of those Jack Black movie. Do you know what I mean? Right. From 2007. Okay, yeah, He's kind of. Nightmare Alley. That'd be an odd combo, right? Right, actor, com- uh, director, actor combo though. Uh, we didn't see Kate Blanchett at all. One we, thing I did. We kind of needed a feminine I mean, impact. I wanted some sensitivity, something just a bit different. Well, you didn't like fair the beast the chicken. Oh, um, let's talk about that scene because there wasn't too many set pieces, and that's the only thing we can really yeah. talk a little bit about. So you were that... abject horror, weren't you? Oh, it was stomach churning. It was horrible. But I don't mind that because it's divisive. But it didn't feel it should have been built up more if it's going to be like that. It was just sort of careless violence, hmm. which didn't really feel like it had a point. We got that he was being maltreated. We didn't need to see that. Unless... Yeah, it sets a tone, doesn't it? I guess, and it's quite yeah. affecting. I guess that was the motive That's a there. That's nice way of putting it. Affecting rather than effective. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's nice. That's that, that's nice. Then my point. Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I did one thing I did quite like about this though was that it was quite gruesome display of the circus that I think too often, and I said this didn't I? We actually don't. Oh, I certainly haven't seen too many circus. Um films because right. and i think that they're, they're so interesting like we've got the greatest showman but that was just horrific just awful just sort of bright lights and saccharin big city mm. saccharin yeah whereas this felt a lot truer to what i imagine circuses were like quite horrible quite sort of gritty you know, yeah. coliseum coliseum for the masses sort of replacing that mm. so i liked that element of it but yeah i'm not sure it was Perhaps handled the best. Basically, Luke, I'm saying I want to play a ringmaster. Yeah, I can see you playing a ringmaster. Um, no, I can see why this is. I can see. Bring on the lions! I can see why this is like figuratively fizzled out of all award yeah. season buzz, and I'm not too interested in watching any more of it. I mean, is it going to be a thriller? It feels like it's going to be a psychological thriller, doesn't it? Yeah, but in a way that. It's telling you it's going to be a thriller rather than being a thriller. Mm-hmm. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> let's move on Cup to. Let's move, let's move on to episode. What? We're already there, are we? No, Luke. Before we do this, I've got to ask you. Can you can you just go and jump on that bed and just absolutely trash it? Is it a good springy bed? I feel horrible. like the opportunities exceptionally you know... firm. It's basically cinder bro- blocks covered with a blanket. Horrible. Cinder block. <laughs> yeah, she's Did a baby. She's on. <laughs> okay, the final film we're doing tonight is... We said the... the best till last. So this is The Kingsman, which is the third in the franchise. Number three. Yeah, yeah. so Kings, Kings is apostrophized. Is that a phrase? Probably not. <laughs> um, it probably has an apostrophe in it. So for me, this is a completely, point... <laughs> a completely pointless <laughs> exercise. It's a, okay, right, guys, we've got to make another movie. Cause I assume they've done quite well. I think they have done quite well. But what's the movie about? What's the point mm-hmm. here? And we, let's not do another sequel. Let's do a prequel. Okay, fine. And then I, I guess I didn't like the original. We, we'll probably talk about the first film in a little bit because Dan 
didn't mind it, I think. Yeah. Um, I thought the reason it was successful, though, is because it was 18 plus. That's why. Yes. And it was, it sort of... Gratuitous. Yeah, gratuitous. And it was, it sort of had this look of, like, uh, wartime British sort of action, like, twattery. You know what I mean? Like, it was like a twat fest, lots of action. Like, it was... Um, Guy Ritchie read a history book and vomit mm-hmm. on the screen. Yeah. That's what it was. And fair enough, it has this weird British swarmness going on and people smacking each other and, like, Cray twin sort of vibes. And I get that, fair enough, but this film didn't have any of that. It, it kept no. the twee British stiffness. It wasn't an 18. It doesn't seem like it's going to be an 18. Because they probably well, there was quite they want to make money. Yeah, but they want to make money. Yeah, but 18s. I mean, unless you're saying some horrific stuff. And we could. Yeah, you're not going to get that up to 18. <laughs> uh, it just... Good. It, it it felt it, this felt boring as hell, and the screenplay was yeah. appalling, really bad. The first one I think captured something in that we were so used to spy films hmm. that were the you know like J, even Born. Yeah, did, did this ride of a... off? This this was carried a bit by the wave of Skyfall, was it? The first one. Yeah, I think so. Bond had that re, Bond came back in a big way with Skyfall, and this sort of rolled that wave a little bit, didn't it? Yeah, let me find this. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the film. First of all, I don't think Ray Fiennes in any point in his career from now until he dies. Yeah, 2014. Sorry, guys. Until, until, until Ray Fiennes, now until he dies, needs a six pack. He doesn't need a six pack in a film. Whatever's going on here, whatever we're doing, it doesn't need to happen. He's, he's either been cast in the wrong film, which is exactly the case, or why is he in that film? We need to see him do acting, not just action sequences. Mind you, he didn't do too much of that, but I think that's coming. Um, what do you it's want to set up the right. plot a little bit then? Because we're in the set in the Boer War. Yeah, well, no. So basically, we've got the from the first two films, we have this idea of this international spy agency that is outside of government laws and is based on these ideas of gentility and nobleness and chivalry, the gentleman. So where's that started? Well, where else would it be started? In the First World War. So you know the. Um, we're getting the premise to this international agency and Ralph finds or Ray finds his character is um, chums with Kitchener. And so he's out in the ball war, loses his wife just through sort of negligence, really. You knew she was going to die though. It's so pretty that scene. There's no yeah. point for that scene other than she was going to get shot in the fanny. You just knew it was going to happen. She's going to die. And then apart from the kid... I've I got mean... a terrible wound. <laughs> Sorry to keep... wound. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to keep flogging this dead horse. But kid acting, like this this felt to me like, do you know what didn't happen of the year awards on Twitter? Which is like that thing happens every year yeah. and they have like kids saying stuff they never said. And the kid was like, oh, when will this blasted war be over? That sounds like <laughs> some made up shit that a parent would put on there. Yeah, uh, kid acting is appalling. Um, it was quite interesting that they shone the lot light on concentration camps, and then didn't touch on it at all ever again. Mentioned it for five seconds, but still. Yeah, it just it. The Kingsman film first time round. I don't know. It just had a sort of unashamed, unashamedliness of like, this is what I am. I'm not trying to be clever. It even had Samuel L. Jackson doing that stupid voice. And then everything else from that feels like it's trying to imitate that. And so by very nature is is not as honest. Like the second one, we had Elton John being the big celebrity star and um, what was uh, uh, Julianne Moore as this villain. And it was all just a bit like, who are we going to get in next? Uh-huh. Do you know what I mean? In the soapbox, who's the guest star today? Uh, this time it's Elton John and, you know, and this one is Ray Fiennes and... Uh, it was Jim someone Rotterton. else. Oh, right, Jim Rotterton, yeah. I don't know, it just... I put what is the motive behind this film, mm-hmm. because it's, it's again, that idea of a cash cow, but it's also just uninspired, crass filmmaking. The villain is this sort of huge, you know... Oh, it's Rasputin. <laughs> well, it's, well, it's not, though, is it? It's Benedict... Uh, not Benedict Cumberbatch. Did you say it's David Tennant? Is it actually... No, oh. I said I said it was Marcus Bridgestock originally, <laughs> and then I said the yeah. Scottish guy is David Tennant, which I don't think it is. I'm almost certain it's not. Uh, okay. Interesting that you say that though, because that's a point I wrote Imagine down. Imagine if it was. Is this is taking itself far too seriously? Like the other films have this tongue-in-cheek silliness, which is kind yeah. of I think that's quite. Even though I don't like them, I can admire the fact that they're spending a hundred a hundred million pound budget, 
and they're just going, yeah, let's make something mental that only we might like. That's actually quite brave. But this is taking itself far too seriously. And they're putting these emphasis on on the lines and what the characters are saying. And they have far too much faith in the characters acting to carry this stuff through. Like some of these lines, which where I find he's saying, I'm surprised he didn't pause and say to the director, are we really doing this line? There's literally a scene where a nanny who's raised his son is talking to him about maybe he should allow his son to like leave the nest a bit more and don't be yeah. so overbearing. And he went, well, I guess sometimes I need a nanny too. It's just like, <laughs> what the, what is that? That's not from yeah. a writer. That's from a producer. That is just, there's no craftsmanship to this script at all. And I just, it just is all, I actually put where is the represent, representation here? Because we don't need to see, if, if the first film set in London in whatever, nowadays, didn't have any diverse cast. The lead was Taron Egerton, Right. John Jeremy Strong was uh, and uh, what's his face? Mark Strong. Uh, Mark Strong. Not Mark Jeremy. Strong, we sorry. do that every episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mark Strong. Uh, Colin Firth. Oh yeah, it was Colin uh, Firth. I was Ma- trying to remember who it was. Michael Caine. You know, okay. Samuel L. Jackson is the villain. I suppose there's a diversity, but his hedge. Um, Samuel L. Jackson. That is my big thing with the first one. I know we went to review in the third one here, but Samuel Jackson had no direction from anyone there. He showed up wearing what he wanted to do. He did the action that he fancied doing. And I, yeah. I honestly don't think he even listened to them say action. He was just talking yeah. for most of the <laughs> parts in that film. Oh, I couldn't stand his performance. It just really felt to me, but this film is just even more down that rabbit hole of let's set it. Oh, Britain. Oh, and he's like, I see you, you know, it's Ralph Fiennes going to Kitchener. Oh, I see you're being a bit barbaric old chap. Like they're in concentration camp. It's fucking war crime. Literally Hitler got the idea from it. Like, do you know what I mean? It's, it's, if you're going to be gritty and edgy and use these things, then be edgy and gritty and real. Don't just do it and then swear and put a fuck in there because it's not, that's not good enough. Mm-hmm. You, you've got to hold films to a higher account and yeah and just you know the butler is black so although it's it, no but do you know what i mean that's what i'm saying it's didn't expect you to say that sorry you just threw me off <laughs> no, but the butler's black okay great so okay but he's in a broad of servitude the son is talking to him like an absolute fucking moron like just incredibly yeah. rude just and also the next... bland tory quips all the time yeah. boring jokes and then the next scene is him fighting and he's like, you know, oh, how are you going to fight with one arm? And he's like, I've already killed you five times. And there are all these marks on his back because obviously he's, you know, from South Africa and you see all the stud marks, you know, the kind of tribal whatever lines of. Um, so it's, you know, oh, he's going to teach him these ways. I mean, it's just a bit like, oh, we've seen this before. Like, can't you tell something different? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I don't I don't. It yeah, shouldn't it's, be made. It shouldn't. It's, it's leaning on these cliches for tension. And sometimes, admittedly, they're slightly cool cliches. And it makes it a little bit more engrossing. But you're not going to be watching. And you said this is also incredibly long as well, right? Over two hours. No, that was... Um, but this is this is also over two this hours. This was DNF. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, anyway, Paul. Also, another another shout out to opening titles... Gotta hate them. Yeah. Just another reminder that you're watching a franchise. Brilliant. Love with stuff. Let you know that you're an it's... ant signing up for the same old shite to watch two hours and spend money in a cinema. Well done, you guys. Two hours ten. Two hours ten. Two hours ten. It's too long. That's too long. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, also, finally, something else I wanted to say. Going back to the whoever Stanley played. Tucci's in this film. Is he? Yeah. Goodness me. I bet he blends into the background. I bet he doesn't go over the top at all in every single fucking scene he's in. Um, it looks hey, like no. he's sucking on a wasp. Uh, so, <laughs> also, I wanted to say is not all actors have comedic range. Like you yes. can just hire someone because you think they they look nice or whatever. But I think that's why the son's been hired. Over whoever's playing Ralph finds his son, just what a, you know what I mean. He looks like a British a tall Harris British. Dickinson. Harris, well, there you go. The unknown <laughs> talent that is Harris Dickinson. Doesn't mean he's got he's comedic range. You probably should try and sift that out in the audition if you're trying to make him put in so many jokes. Just a heads up to casting directors everywhere. Yeah. Um, Dan, it's never the third film that wins. <laughs> it's never. It never is. Uh, Matthew Vaughan, unfortunately, mate, we're not going to be choosing film. Yeah, that's correct. So that um, <laughs> Uh, okay, Dan, <laughs> let's talk, well, 
we're watching. Do you want to watch Tony Red or do you want to watch um, what's the second yeah. one? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's Nightmare Alley. Yeah, Nightmare Alley. Tony Red. Although That's to... I put Right Mare, and it looks like Right Move, which I'd watch if Guillermo del Toro did Right Move Alley. I'd watch that. That's nice. It's up your street. There you go. <laughs> Hey, boom, boom. thank you. Right, Dan, let's let you talk bafters then. Luke, so, crane that... your neck. <laughs> you crane my neck. With a good yeah. joke. Um, oh, satire. <laughs> Dan, satire word. Here he is. Writing's on the wall. No one's safe. Uh, so, <laughs> Dan, you watched for the for the podcast, and well done for you taking this bullet. You watched the bafters the other night. I did. Why don't you have a quick couple of minutes on the bafters. Who won? What do you think of Rebel Wilson? Let's go. Oh. What did I think of Rebel Wilson? Wilson got better as it got on. Um, Why? Because he got closer to good. the finish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, just very stilted and, and unnatural, and not a natural mm-hmm. role for her at all. She didn't no, look. She didn't like. She, she didn't like. She was in the right skin. <laughs> <laughs> she has lost a lot of weight. Hanging off her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how many? How many staples are in her back? <laughs> Carrying that fat. Uh, horrible. Being me. No need. <laughs> really anyway. <being> <laughs> um. Yeah, she wasn't a good fit at all. Um, Benedict yeah. Cumberbatch deservedly um, didn't win the Oscar. <laughs> didn't win. <laughs> didn't win the Oscar. <laughs> the Probably should have. It wasn't enough to. Oh, Will Smith. Uh, Will Smith. Smith. He wasn't even there. Yeah, because he wasn't. Oh, so he went to the critic when he went to the Critics' Choice. Also, did you see Jane Campion's speech at the Critics' Choice Award? Jane Campion. Oh, win, what? The, no, the one on the Alec. Uh, the one on the when she was talking about the comments made by uh, Thingy. She talks like this. About... <laughs> Hi, everyone. In Sharon She's Kiwi. You've got to throw a bit of twang in there. <laughs> did. Brett. Did. <laughs> and Serena to the Valorum sisters. You're so amazing. She made this weird comment. Have you seen the clip? Uh, she no. She made this weird comment where she was like, oh, uh, um, Serena... You know you're amazing. Uh, you know William sisters, you're amazing, but you don't have the men like I do. And it just didn't land. It was sort of weirdly like, yeah, but what? It just I don't know. It was a weird speech. It's yeah, there was a. Way. It was not memorable. There's a American just... actor. I'm blanking on his name now. Oh God, you know him. He's been in westerns and stuff, and he was in. He was in a Tarantino film. They were no, no, no. Um, and he made a comment basically about the film, I think criticising its like authenticity in terms of Western genre, and she kind of just right. went after him. And it's like, people are allowed to dislike your films. It, it did feel very yeah, strange. You... And she seems like they're the front runner for the Oscars, right? Yeah. I mean... You, chucked it, you put it in your whatever. top ten. It wasn't really in mine. Uh, let's go back to the BAFTAs, though. Other people that won... Yeah. Um the, um, the lady that won supporting actress, she's pretty much got that like, sewn up, hasn't she, for the Oscars as well? Oh, but actress was a bit yeah, different, wasn't it? Story. Joanna Scanlon for um, After Love. A couple of things. Um, Coda, Coda and After Love both piqued on my interest, which I hadn't really given much time of day for. So I you were deaf to it, weren't that. you, Dan? I was deaf to all all the tacks. Um, best speech went to the director of Drive My Car. Yeah, remember his name? Give him some respect, Dan. His Japanese name. Go on. <laughs> No, I think you've. Seen, I haven't seen the film, but you have. Remind me. I, I've, I was going to watch. I planned to buy my ticket and everything. And as yeah. I was buying my ticket, I found out it was three hours. And I've tweeted about this. I've. I, I will not be sit, watching a free. You know. You're not up to date on that. Uh, apparently, Dominic Bird isn't responding. Uh, calling you out, sunshine. <laughs> going after him. <laughs> we want a little beer. Let's get the record straight here. Also, by the way, this podcast should finish ten minutes ago. Anyway, <laughs> Dominic Burgess agreed to come on the podcast agreed <laughs> he's gonna be our first guest and we're gonna start season three with him right now admit what are you it, doing i was what a bit slow you doing? i was a bit slow to reply fine but i replied very polite sort of witty nice very like very um modest yeah grateful as well <laughs> modest <laughs> grateful and everything and hasn't he's left me on red he's left me on red Dan, and i'm fuming and i'm red i'm going red um You're turning red which is the film we'll be watching next week for next week. Dan Segway King Wade. Uh, Dan, thank you for joining us. We'll be back next no. week. Let's thank the audience, Luke, for listening and watching. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, next week might be slightly skewed because I'm off to Latvia. Yeah. So, fingers crossed. Both. 
<laughs> okay, everyone. Thank you very much. See you next bye time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.